Okay, thank you all for coming. So I assume if you come here, you to some degree interested in the, what I'm going to talk here. And uh, so today I'm going to focus on you know one of my research areas. I'm trained as a fluvial geomorphology. So the area which is quite different from you guys I have been doing, but I also am, have been doing the research on the I call the geo. Uh, geospatial based urban studies. It is this area that actually linked to your interest and your research and Jason's uh, research. So today I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of reflect on what I have been um, done in the past few years. And then based on that, introduce you some ideas I have right now uh, with regards to the collaboration between me and some professors in uh, public health and anthropology at the Syracuse University. So uh, I will start by introducing you briefly this concept of uh, geo, uh, geospatial patterns and analysis. And then I will talk about three examples of, of my own research uh, relevant to this. And then I will introduce uh, briefly this concept of uh, urban environment. I know some of you have already know this very well. And then I will show you some examples uh, regarding to how geospatial analysis are used, uh, have been used in study ur uh, uh, urban built environment. Uh, and then I will briefly introduce you the ongoing research project uh, in this direction. And then I will uh, conclude, uh, conclude in the end. There is a lot when I practice uh, on this talk, so I try to be brief and leave some time uh, for questions and discussions in the end. Okay, I started from the first one, the geospatial, uh, and, uh, geospatial patterns and analysis. So what is the geospatial pattern? It's basically, it refers to the distribution or configuration of geo geographic information or phenomena. And uh, uh, so the other word you, you, wa you want to think about is uh, spatial variation of uh, attributes. And what is a, a geospatial analysis? Uh, that basically means uh, we quantify the spatial patterns using different uh, techniques. And we also study the relationships between or among different spatial patterns. And this set of concepts is based on one of the fundamental theory or idea in geography called the first law of geography. And this law says everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. It sounds very easy, and maybe you say, hey, I already know that, but it has profound implications with regards to geospatial science, geospatial techniques. I will uh, touch on this later on. Okay, next, uh, I will give you some examples of my own research and uh, explain what we have done. The first one is so-called snow plowing analysis. So this one basically comes from this uh, idea. Like a couple of years ago, I, uh, I listened to the news and heard from my colleagues about uh, like local people in Syracuse basically uh, during winter time, they complained about the lack of snow plowing in their area. They make the call to the city, city hall, and this really make me to to uh, uh, to wonder, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean they are treated unfairly? Oh, this is just the, the nature of the snow plowing structure. So, with this question, I want to say basically, I uh, I I want to try to say. Okay, whether there is a so-called social injustice in this kind of uh, uh, management. So I got the data. Uh, this is actually open uh, access data, the, uh, the snow plot data in four events. And each point you see here is essentially uh, a GPS point. When the truck lowered down their plot, and uh, they actually uh, take uh, the measurement, the GPS take a measurement. So just imagine these points, each one of this, these points represent the locations recorded by more than 10 trucks, maybe 20 trucks. 
Okay, so what this is the original data I, I collected. So the goal here is the first step is to identify or, or explore the geospatial patterns of this uh, of this data to reflect uh, the uh, snowplow activities. So what we did is in this case, uh, I combined data together to simplify that. And also the data was uh, aggregated based on street segment. So that means we, we needed to uh, create a street, street network for in the first place. And the, to be fair, this is not easy because if you download the street network data, that data is actually messy. So what we did is that by sum, uh, summary the number of points along each street segment, we did the geospatial analysis. So basically, should, should, uh, try to uh, explore the, whether there is a clustered pattern or not. So this shows you the result of geospatial analysis. So without getting into details, all I want to tell you is that it indicates that uh, there is a statistically significant cluster in this distribution. And the different colors here represent the different values of a number of snow plots along each street segment. And then the next study is to try to see whether there is, okay, we know in overall there is a cluster pattern. So whether there is a spatially vari variable clusters, local clusters, we call that. So this is the analysis called the hotspot analysis. The red color, red area basically tells you, okay, in this area, so the uh, snow plow, the number frequency of a snow plow tends to be high. And in this blue area, so the snow plow uh, frequency tends to be low. So you do see statistically significant uh, uh, local patterns with regards to snow plow activities. So that's the one aspect. Now, another aspect is that we want to see try to figure out, a way, we want to explain whether this pattern indicate social injustice or not. Using a plain word, we want to say, okay, whether uh, the, the, the high frequency of snow plot is the way it is. It's not because there are too many poor people. The way we did that is that we use the number of street, uh, the lanes as a way to, to quantify the the needs of a snow plow. So the idea is that the wider the street, the more snow plow, the more frequency of snow plow you would expect, right? So that's the general idea. With this idea, we did a similar analysis of general snow plow or geospatial patterns. This result indicated there is a significant clusters. And this also shows you there is a local patterns. Uh, with regards to the street, okay, structurally. So the question is, uh, are they the, uh, the similar or the different? So what we did is that we compared these two different spatial patterns uh, by standarding values, standard, standardizing the values, uh, and then subtract the one from the other. And this is the result, the, the result of uh, this subtraction. And then that we studied this difference. Now think about that. If uh, there is no, a uh, hundred percent no social injustice, that means uh, one street would get more uh, snow plow. So when you do the subtraction, you would get a zero. So you don't get the value variations of values uh, across the entire study area. But that's not the case. So when we do the uh, uh, hot analysis, we even see a lot of uh, like uh, this. Uh, uh, hot spot, which means uh, that this areas uh, tend to plot more than average. Uh, cold spot means the opposite. So what does that mean? I mean, at this point, I would say there are certain degree, it appears that there are certain degree of social injustice, uh, but not much. So essentially, this result uh, lead me, I mean, I cannot get the, the, uh, the absolute uh, uh, conclusion. Because of that, uh, we're, we're planning to do more analysis. The key here that make me feel like it's inconclusive is that we used the number of lanes to represent the structure, physical structure, and I think it's oversimplified. So what we are going to do is, as you can see here, we're going to use the 
the, the models used in this study, uh, which is uh, called a vehicle ro uh, writing problem solver, to basically study the actual, the, the more rigor rigorously study the physical structure of a street network. In particular, we need to consider the, the degree of connectivity among the streets. And then based on that, we will link that to the snow problem numbers to compare that, that gives us the idea of fairness. And after we do that, we're planning to up, uh, upgrade that, to uh, upscale that to the census block group scale, and then link that to social economic factors such as population, such as the household income, etc. And now we can get much better, much of a certain conclusions. Okay, so this is the first one. The second one is the, is the, the vulnerability analysis about the uh, flood events. So in the past, uh, we did one, uh, uh, like a, we, assume, we, did a, uh, we simulated a one flood event. Assuming Syracuse has a, this 500 year flood event, very extreme event. We never have ever had that uh, yet. The highest event is probably near 100, 100 year event. Okay, just give you the idea. So this is a really uh, extreme event. And uh, we did some, uh, this is the result we got. And you can see this simulation gives you the sense of how the inundation process happens through this. Okay, so this gives us, uh, okay, the area will be inundated in the uh, city of Syracuse uh, during this event. So what we did here, actually, one of my students that oops, uh, did this is that uh, uh, he, he tried to, based on this result, to study the vulnerability of the flood event. What he did is that he used this so-called uh, the fuzzy anal uh, analytical hierarchical process model. And in this model, the key idea is that you select uh, the factors relevant to the vulnerability. The direct factor like DEM, uh, digital uh, elevation, uh, uh, digit, digital, uh, digital elevation model, distance to the of a river, uh, to the river and the vegetation slope, etc. These are the physical factors that directly affect the affect the vulnerability, and then some indirect factors: population, economic status, land use, buildings. So by collecting this data. And uh, you, I, uh, you, you identify their spatial patterns, uh, and then you establish a model. And in this model, the key is to determine the uh, parameters of uh, the, the coefficient of this, uh, this uh, uh, factors. And that, based on the model, it allows you to calculate the vulnerability. These are the, uh, the results for the eight uh, fa uh, factors I mentioned just now. Using that model, they, uh, we can identify, we can determine the assess the parameters. Uh, and you can see from these parameters uh, that distance to, uh, to the creek uh, has the highest weight. This uh, makes sense, right? The closer to the river, the more dangerous, right? Something like that. It makes sense uh, when you look at that. And then there is a, a vulnerability equation established. But based on that, uh, the, the, we can create this vulnerability map here. And the, the, uh, the, the darker, the orange means uh, the high degree, uh, high degree of vulnerability, okay? And uh, what is the problem? This looks uh, fancy, looks beautiful. The real problem, problem to me is that uh, this result doesn't help us to understand the vulnerability too much. Why? Because if you look at the pattern of this, uh, it's very similar to the distance to the river. In other words, I don't have to draw this model. I mean, just based on the topography, look at this elevation. So that basically tells me the lower areas has a high vulnerability. I have already know that. Why do I do that, right? This is the main concern I have this. So this, this analysis sounds cool, but it doesn't provide something really new. So what we plan to do next, what I plan to do is that to, to take advantage of this, uh, uh, this framework from this study. So this framework basically say, okay, we calculate uh, 
the the loss, the, the, the direct loss and the indirect loss due to flood. But uh, so on the one hand, they calculated that they developed this loss curve based on the buildings that are affected by fl different flood events. On the other hand, they use the stream network, water network, et cetera, uh, built environment and develop this uh, household dislocation pattern. And then they combine this together, they develop this curve. So social di uh, disruptions, business disruptions. And based on this process, they can calculate the direct cost, the indirect cost, put them together, give you the idea of a given area that has been affected by different flood events. I'm not going to use this directly, but I think this gives me a very good idea. Because my focus would be will be a uh, spatial variable degrees of flood risk, which means uh, you can see in this map, that's what we have already got. These are all the flood inundation zones. And think about that. Uh, when a flood happened, it's not only these uh, uh, people and the houses in this zone will be affected. The zones in the houses in the neighboring areas, areas will be affected for sure, right? So how do you take that into consideration? That to me is more important so that I can tell not all the people have the same degree of, uh, uh, facing the same degree of a flood risk in, in, in this area. So my, my idea is uh, use this, each red block represent the spatial scale called the census block group. This is based on US Census of Bureau's definition. Okay, and then I will study the uh, loss curve based on each uh, building's inundation areas in each census block group because I can calculate the mean inundation depth. I can calculate the uh, number of houses being affected by the flood event. And then using this and other factors, I can create a different uh, loss, loss curve and I can also create a, a different uh, household uh, dislocation pattern not for the diff uh, different event, but only just for this extreme event. So that's the direction I'm going to go with regards to this research. The third one, uh, performance-based 3D mapping. Um, I, okay, it's, a, it's called the location-based services, okay? And uh, what is this? So basically, uh, all the maps, uh, most of the time you see typically is called uh, information-based 3D mapping service. I give you the example. So this is a commercialized 3D map. You can, if you go to this map, you can download the actually this kind of map. If you want it, you need to pay, okay? Uh, and also there are some open, uh, uh, um, like open access map. If you go there, you can download this 3D buildings and you can, you can download the data. Not only you can see the 3D buildings, you, you can download the data. So what's the point? The information-based uh, uh, map uh, uh, service means uh, this map gives you the visual content. You can see the Adirondack, uh, the, the, the highs and lows, the variations, right? You see the image of Syracuse. Uh, and here you see the uh, 3D buildings for sure. You can download the data. But the problem here, not the problem, but the limit is that uh, if you want to do more, you cannot use this map. And in my case, I, I'm talking about uh, UAV service. Okay, let's see. If I want to fly UAV, this map cannot tell me where to fly and whether I can fly or not. So what that leads to, this performance-based uh, 3D mapping service, what does that mean? We want to provide the maps based on information-based uh, maps but with more information that can directly guide the people's decision. That is, uh, where can I fly the, uh, the UAV? Is uh, a given uh, area of the uh, Syracuse uh, worth flying, uh, flying uh, UAV? All of this kind of uh, like very specific, specific that can guide people's uh, activity, the, the actions. We call that, uh, I call that a performance-based study uh, service. 
And this, so we developed this system, IUDMS, integrated UAV delivery mapping service. And this service contains three parts. First part is essentially develop performance-based mapping. And so basically in this case, specifically IUDMS, I developed three performance-based maps. The first one is called potential needs for UAV delivery, PN. And this one basically is the combination of two information-based map, uh, household income and the population. And the, the, the function of this map is that it can tell the user or company whether, it's a, uh, whether there is a potential need for doing UAV de uh, delivery or not, okay? And the second one is uh, the urban forms. In this one, I combined the three typical relevant urban form parameters. I will talk about this later. One is seniority, defined in this way, porosity, divided in this way, and occlusivity, divided in this way. I combine them together so that this factor, this map, UF, urban form map, represent the 3D structure of a group of buildings. So that's the meaning of uh, this, uh, uh, this map, uh, performance-based map. And uh, this map can be directly used by UAV pilot and uh, to tell him or her whether you can fly to a given, given uh, area, okay? And then the third one is uh, called a delivery potential for targeted area. So this is essentially a combination of the two. And then this basically for a company, let's say Amazon, they can based on this to determine whether it's worth to fly to, let's say, downtown Syracuse or to the Manlius, okay? And this map gave them this idea so that they can make decision where to, to fly, uh, whether they can make profit or not. And uh, so this is the first step. The second step is that we plan to do some fear, real, uh, like a field-based measurement to essentially quantify those parameters. Okay, and then this is the second step. The third step is here. It's basically we will create an app. And this app will be available online by anyone, individual or group or company, anyone. And this system is called IUDMS. And what I showed you here is the architecture of this, uh, this app. And this architecture essentially contains three parts. The dark uh, orange part in the center are uh, storage stores a performance based map. So, this is the uh, core part that we, as the owner, we access to this, we manage this, maintain this. The second part is uh, this inner circle here, orange circle here. This contains all of the uh, performance based map. And, uh, users can access to them, them, we also can access to them. And the third part is the yellow part, you can see that's basically uh, application platform APIs. So this, I, this system can be, can be accessed by individual users. Also the individual users can have input, whether they like this or not, all the suggestions, the kind of suggestions you, they have. This is through this open API. By doing that, we collect the data directly from users and then we, we, we fine tune our uh, performance based map. And uh, the last one is that it also has a functions to link to the UAV such that when pilot fly, fly the, uh, a drone, they have this map available. So that to me is very powerful. We have done this before. And uh, I have applied a provisional patent for this, uh, but it's already uh, expired, unfortunately. And uh, I also, uh, the, a, comp a local company and me worked on this, we applied for NSF, small business, uh, SBIR, small business and innovation program. And we didn't get it, but we really got a lot of very positive uh, uh, suggestions, unfortunately. I, I, I don't have the company with me to, who is willing to do that. So if any one of you feel like you're interested in doing this, please contact me. I'm really into this and I can talk to you more about this. 
I do see there is a, a big potential here. And so far, I can tell you, there's no such a system has been developed. Okay, uh, now let's go to the next uh, uh, topic, uh, urban built environment, okay? So uh, what is urban built environment? I think many of you know this. It's uh, human-made surroundings that provide the setting for human activity. It could be uh, ranging from buildings, parks, green space to neighborhoods and cities that can often include their supporting infrastructures. Okay, so commonly, when we think about the urban building environment, we think about these three components. The first is the land use, which contains building types like residence, industry, business, mixed use, infrastructure types, road, water, power network, all of that. And the second type is land cover. It's essentially space. Green space, forest, water bodies, and uh, building coverage. And the third part is the urban morphology or urban form. Some of you are very familiar with this part. And this urban form morphology contains three attributes. First is attributes, spatial skills, and the parameters. So I like to speak a little bit more about that. What is the attributes of urban morphology or urban form? It's essentially about the topological relationships and the 3D structure of a group of buildings, such as the proximity, the intensity, diversity, connectivity, and the distribution. Okay, you, have, you can have more about this. And then what is the scale? The scale basically means you can, uh, you can study urban morphology of these attributes for a building complex, for uh, several buildings, for buildings within a block, within a neighborhood a district, that are all entire city. So you can do the, you can combine them and do all kinds of analysis. But when you do that, how do you, how can you quantify the urban morphology? That comes down to the parameters. So what I listed here are some examples of commonly used or mentioned the urban morphology parameters. The list is not exhaustive. I have to mention that, okay? And uh, this uh, picture gives you some ideas of what, the, what does each, uh, some of the parameters means. Uh, like uh, you can see, seniority basically gives you the idea of orientation of a group of uh, the buildings. Uh, this uh, uh, height and width ratio gives you the space concept here, okay? And in reality, most of these parameters have been used to study, uh, I think uh, the build physics have been used, the, all of, many of these parameters, they use this to study air uh, distribution, and energy consumption, et cetera. I don't mean they are not used in other areas, okay, to be clear here. And, uh, and the next, I really want to, based on what I talked about, the urban, uh, urban building environment, give you three typical examples to show how in the past geospatial analysis has been used to study urban, urban build environment. This is the example. The first example is uh, talking about uh, the concentration of urban porosity, of uh, urban poverty, okay? I mainly focus on the technology part, the methodology part, okay? So you can see in this map, the, uh, the, they use, uh, they basically presented uh, the uh, poverty, uh, uh, the, I think the data was looked at the so-called census tract. And this is another special unit used by US uh, Census Bureau. So you can see in this map, they present you, the red color represents census tract uh, with high uh, poverty. So from 2000 to this uh, 2009, 2013, you do see a lot more red area and spreading out, right? So using this, they argue that uh, the urban poverty the, uh, in this uh, Detroit, this is, uh, uh, is actually expanding. Okay, so that's the one way they use the, uh, they use a geospatial analysis. Second one, in this one, they select the, a group of cities, medium-sized cities across the United States 
they did the similar analysis. What you can see here is that red color basically represent the cities that are, have more population with the poverty, right? So it basically gives you the idea of a spatial distribution, but no analysis here involved in. But they do, to be fair, they, they did some analysis here. What the analysis they did is essentially non-spatial statistic analysis. They just grab the data from each census tract and link the, the numbers to the corresponding population, for example, household income, for example, and that made a plot like that. So essentially, this is a non-spatial statistic analysis. So the only sense of geospatial analysis is the, they use the built environment, in this case, a census tract, all the cities, okay? And uh, so that's the first example, concentration of urban poverty. Second example is uh, about uh, how urban built environment affect uh, public emotion, okay? Uh, it's blocked there, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, so the first, this is the study happened in, uh, in, 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 in a city in China called Wuhan. I, I think many of you know this city. And uh, one thing I do want to point out is this so-called traffic analysis zone. So in China, they don't have this uh, special unit as in U.S. We, based on U.S. Census Bureau. We have a census tract, the census block group, census block, and census... Uh, uh, yeah, census block. This is a hierarchical spatial units we can group the data. So each 10 years you get updated uh, uh, census data is based on these spatial skills. In China, they don't have this. So in this case, uh, they specifically used uh, uh, this uh, so-called traffic analysis zone. That's the space that developed uh, in China. Okay, the first thing, uh, actually very interesting thing they did is that they want to quantify the public emotion. How do you, how do you quantify public emotion? They actually use the, the Weibo in China. It's like kind of similar to TikTok, okay? So they get the text message from Weibo, and then they analyze the, the vocabulary. So if, you, if there's a happy vocabulary, then that means they're happy. If they, they complain about the transportation, whatever, it's, it, it's not happy, right? And then they developed this uh, emotion score. And this gives you the idea, that's the result they got, okay? And, uh, and then next, uh, what, we, what they did is that they, they try to select the parameters to represent the urban built environment. In this case, uh, they go to all the three categories I mentioned just now, land use, land cover, urban morphology, okay? And uh, based on that, uh, here I just give you one example to, to, to give you the idea of what does the data look like, okay? And of course, in this data, this is about the traffic data. They have to convert that into this uh, uh, traffic analysis zone to match the data. And then what they did was that they, they run the so-called uh, uh, geographic weighted regression GWR. And this is one of the uh, uh, common uh, geospatial analysis. Essentially, this is a, a multilinear regression analysis. On the left-hand side, they have this uh, emotion score. On the left, right-hand side, they have 13 variables they selected out of the table I showed you just now, and then they run the regression, linear regression, but this is a geographically weighted linear regression. What does that mean? It means that if you look at each one of them, each variable has a spatial pattern. So the classic multilinear regression ignored the spatial uh, correlation among the data. So this, uh, this model take that into consideration. So the way you understand this is that this is what the 13 results, each, each one of them basically tells you for this variable, if you have this, uh, uh, this color, uh, uh, like a red color concentrated area, that means that in this area, this variable has a positive impact on emotion. And in this area, this variable has negative impact on the on the public emotion, okay? So that's the way you interpret that. 
the take home message is that it shows you the spatial variation, the local clusters of the impact. Okay, so that's what I have already talked about, the building environment, the geospatial analysis, how they combine this in this analysis. And the third one, the third one is uh, uh, mapping uh, urban uh, built environment stock uh, in, in, in Beijing, China. So what is the build, uh, urban built environment stock? It basically refers to materials and products that stay in the anthroposphere, anthroposphere over a certain time period. Make it uh, simple. It basically means if you have a group of buildings, uh, the buildings has functions like allow people to live, right? So this kind of function we call service, okay? So how do you quantify that? So this is uh, urban, urban built environment stocks quantify this. So basically the way they quantify this is that they, uh, they can calculate the, the air recovered by a certain type of uh, uh, the certain type of a built environment, like the buildings, like roads, uh, or uh, yeah, buildings, roads, the real ways, uh, you can, they can calculate the areas of each one type of these bu uh, buildings, uh, buildings, and then they can calculate the their their materials, which essentially means uh, uh, their services. Okay, there are ways they can use to quantify them. And then they, they, they multiply them together to get this uh, uh, urban, urban, uh, urban building environment stocks. So this is just the example I want to give you one of the data, land use data. How does this look like? You, uh, this is the very first step when they collect the data. And this is the result I want to show you. They actually uh, provided the uh, urban building environment, uh, uh, building environment stocks for the study here. This is uh, the Beijing, okay, and uh, and then they try to link the urban uh, urban building environment stocks to some social economic uh, variables in the same area. In this case, uh, this is a GDP, okay. So that's again uh, give you the idea how this is. Geospatial analysis has been used in this kind of study. And indeed, as I showed here, there's no specific geospatial analysis used in this study. Okay, so why I want to bring this up? Because I want to call your attention on one thing that is the spatial scale. I'm sorry, there's this bar, this guy just covered this. And the, the point is that uh, you see the city is this area, right? When they collect the data, they, 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 they use a grid that divided the entire area. So this, as a result, all of their data are grouped in grid. Why I want to talk about that, I mean, you, when you do the, the simulation, when you do the mesh, most of the time you use grid, right? There's nothing new here. But if you think about the geospatial analysis, it's important because there are two different types of ways to arrange data. One is rust data, which is grid. Another is vector data, which is like you use a different, uh, we call it polygons. Uh, the, you have a, the, si the different size of areas to represent your study area. So that's why I want to mention this. Okay, uh, that's enough for like a, uh, build environment and my own research. And, uh, I like to spend a few minutes to really explain to you the ongoing project. Uh, I am uh, collaborating with uh, some folks from public health and the uh, anthropology department at Syracuse University. So we are try what we are trying to do is that we want to expose or reveal the social political mechanism that cause disproportionate wealth between white and the black groups in the city of Syracuse. I don't know if you know or not, Syracuse is one of the, the 10 cities in the United States that has the highest inequality with regards to poverty. So we have the highest poverty uh, among the medium sized and the large size of cities in the United States. So, so that's what we want to study. And our general hypothesis is that, you know, this kind of inequality is 
fundamentally caused by social economic structure and associated policies uh, rather than individuals' personality. Now, if you understand, if you if you're familiar with the social science studies in this area, even like just the read, uh, uh, watch news, uh, to be frank, this is not new. Okay, many studies have done in social science on these issues. And these studies basically concluded that actually the poverty, the inequality is caused by, it is fundamentally, is caused by so-called systematic racism and the social economic structure rather than biological predisposition. Okay, we have know that. And also this study is, uh, uh, states that the systematic racism actually can be described spatially based on neighborhood. But what's missing here? Well, to me, there are three limitations uh, in the current study. The first one is, uh, uh, is uh, this conclusion that most of these studies uh, based on this assumption that this, uh, uh, this social uh, the discrimination systematic uh, racism or inequality in poverty was mainly caused by red line policies that applied in the United States in the 1960s. And in Syracuse, this idea is not quite right because even before that, back in the 1920s, actually there is a big movement in the United States called the Great Migration of Black People. So many Black people in southern, uh, in southern part of the United States, Florida, um, uh, uh, yeah, Texas uh, actually moved to the north. Uh, a big proportion of them actually landed in Syracuse. Uh, and this movement uh, actually profoundly changed the structure of population of the city. And this effect hasn't been taken into consideration in the past studies. The second limitation, all of this, many of, the, of them, if not all, uh, uh, touched on uh, the urban built environment, right? Block neighborhood, they touched on that. But now, I, I don't want to see now because I did go through all of the studies. Based on my literature review, none of the studies basically uh, seriously studied the impact of building, uh, built environment on this social economic issue, in particular, the urban morphology. There's no research touched on uh, urban, the impact of urban morphology. The third one, all of these studies uh, mainly based on either qualitative description or non-spatial uh, statistical analysis, as I showed you just now in the e example of uh, concentration of poverty. Okay, so to me, this means that the important, uh, like, uh, 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 nature of the issues that is a uh, spatial variability. Okay, so putting this together, I propose to study this uh, this issue from by in, uh, by considering build the impact of built environment, uh, urban building environment in particular, urban uh, uh, urban morphology. And uh, the idea is like this: when you think about these uh, uh, these factors. Uh, uh, social mechanism is actually a very complicated fact, uh, uh, processes that have interaction with each other. You would identify a lot of chain effects, like more uh, black people move the year because they don't have a good job, they're poor. And if they, they have a poor, their families tend to have a higher uh, infant uh, mobility. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, their neighborhood tend to have more violent uh, crimes, right? You can make act to list a lot of this kind of a chain effect. So the idea here is that I can pick up one of the chain effect, make it as a standalone study re research project, and I I can try to identify the mechanism, the social uh, uh, mechanism, and mainly based on the geospatial analysis, which means I will quantify the geospatial patterns, I will identify geospatial relationships among the factors. 
And uh, that's the idea I want to uh, I want to develop. And uh, and uh, the last thing I want to mention a little bit is uh, I really want to give you idea. I I. I have the sense not all of you convinced that geospatial pets uh, relationships are useful. So I, I want to use the two examples to quickly give you uh, the idea why I think geospatial patterns, geospatial analysis are powerful. The first one, this is a gunshot incident in this period, 20, 2009 to uh, 2015. Okay, now what I showed you are three different types of geospatial analysis. The first one is a commonly used one. You get the numbers of incidents in each census block group and then you show them. You see visually the spatial pattern, right? What is the second one? I use this data, I developed a continuous result. Okay, yeah, you see something similar, but the, there are something different because this uh, actually shows a continuous uh, a change of uh, the gunshot event that's beyond the boundary of uh, census block groups. And this actually can be used to study the potential influence of gunshot event. And the third one is even more interesting. This is a hard, hard code spot analysis. What does this shows you is here. This is the hot spot. Definitely, this is the air dangerous area in Syracuse, for sure. I mean, you, you, I can tell you this. And this is the safest area in, uh, in, in, uh, in city of Syracuse because, uh, uh, because they are both statistically significant. So what's interesting is this. If you look at this map, you still see a large number of uh, gunshot events right here. So you would feel like this area is actually dangerous because there are a lot of uh, gunshots. But from a statistic perspective, you, you see here is black, it's white. What does that mean? That means that this cluster of uh, high number of gunshots is not statistically significant. So in other words, it may not be as, uh, uh, as dangerous as you thought. So this is from geospatial perspective to give you to interpret the data. The point is that each different, uh, if each different result gives you different aspects of the problem here, gunshot, you can have, you can have different interpretations based on the patterns. Okay, now the second one, some of you might be very interested in. I talk about the total energy consumption for the, for the uh, 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 Syracuse. So to be clear, I don't have this data. Okay, I'm relying on you. So you're going to uh, listen to the next the speaker who will talk about this. I don't have this data, but I, I, I create this data manually to showcase. Okay, this here, I give you a different uh, 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 types of geospatial patterns. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, talk too much because I'm running out of time. But I just want to talk about this one, which I think is interesting. What does this mean? This is the, uh, a type of geospatial analysis. It basically means that if I group the data, uh, group the data at a one kilometer spatial scale, two kilometer, 2.5, three kilometer, so different spatial unit, if I group the data, imagine I will get a distribution of the data. Is there any spatial patterns of this data at this different spatial scales? This curve basically tells you some shows the relatively stronger spatial pattern, some shows less, but overall there's no spatial patterns at all because none of them are statistically significant. What does that mean? There's no spatial patterns for this data, no matter which spatial scale you go to, 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 to uh, uh, aggregate your data. And this is true because I created this data using random process in the first place. Of course, there shouldn't be any spatial pattern here, right? So I hope using this example gives you the idea, the power of geospatial techniques and analysis. Uh, in conclusion here, uh, I said I want to study this awareness gap awareness gap between different ethnic groups. And this awareness gap could be viewed from uh, uh, physical limitations, social uh, cons uh, constraints, and health deficiencies. These are three aspects, big aspects. 
And to, in, to look into this, you have to face the problems, social existing social health problems. And this existing social health problems inevitably, or I should say, in, intrinsically connected social status of the people nowadays. They also connected to the built environment. What kind of buildings they live? What kind? Uh, how how close their buildings? Uh, what is their uh, neighborhood, etc.? And each one of them has some uh, uh, variables we can use to represent them. Okay. And uh, if you think about the three of them together, they actually could uh, form a different chain effect that can lead us to explain either one of, uh, uh, of these three. Okay, now my proposal is we can use uh, geospatial techniques to study geospatial patterns, ge geospatial relationships among the variables along each one of these uh, chains. And to do that, we really need to collect the data to represent all of them. We need to do modeling, we need to do GIS analysis, we need to go to other open access to get the data, and we need to do the interview analysis. All of this cannot be done by one group, one people. It really calls for the people from engineers, geographers, social scientists, public health and the local communities. So with that in mind, I propose, I call for the collaborations for the scientists from different disciplines. Thank you. I stop here for questions. Yeah. Snowplow thing, and I know that was about five years ago, and I think it quit snowing about five years ago in this city. <laughs> and so it'd be interesting to see whether or not just you know not only that one, but the one with the gunshot, where many city departments have probably been you know noodling in their head for years over these same things. Did you get input from them or? I do. When I uh, try to get the data, I contact uh, the local uh, uh, like city of uh, Syracuse. I think they have uh, one department, I forgot the name, city planning department or whatever. I talk to their directors and uh, their staff members. Uh, when I'm, I try I'm thinking to... beyond the data. You get the data, but what about the analysis they had done prior to your um, I don't think they have uh, done any this kind of analysis. There's no such analysis has been done. Well, not that type. But what, what did the like the snow plow, if you live on a side street, you're doomed. Yeah, they have a plan where to uh, dispatch the trucks. They, they do have that plan. Uh, like each year when snow uh, happens, uh, where should uh, I to dispatch? Uh, the manager dispatches the number of trucks to given rot. They also have a rot. Uh, develop a city has that. So I would think that person would be the first person to collaborate yeah. with yeah. snow plow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel comfortable at this stage, as I said, he explained to you just now. I don't think our analysis is rigorous enough, which is why I want to do more analysis before. Interesting analysis. I, I have two questions, both more related. But I know people show data like what you have shown, snow plow. There's always a heavy component of auto correlation in these data. How do you factor it up? That's the main reason I came to see how you handle that data. The second part of your modeling, you're talking about Z factors. It goes back to the old story. But if you give a statistician five points, you can fetch an elephant. So Unless you can validate that your data, in your case it's true, but unless you validate your data matches uh, the requirement for normality, you cannot use predictive statistics. Your random data will give you independence, but you don't know if it's, uh, so, so there are better ways to do that. I'm wondering how you handle it. 
Yeah, oh, thank you for your questions. Uh, and uh, it's a tough question, I have to say. <laughs> uh, the first one, yeah, <laughs> the first one uh, is actually the big problem. And uh, I, uh, when we really, that's actually one reason why when I proposed this uh, ongoing research project, I said there are several, you see my, my, my past, right? Several objectives uh, because uh, it's too complicated. I can only like uh, divide them into a, a small pieces and study them. Even with one chain reaction, when I run into, uh, when I go to uh, collect the data, I may run into the, the, the issue. This is the one of the big challenge. The challenge is that uh, the available data in the United States, the data typically available at the census tract level, larger areas. And we want to get a smaller data at a smaller uh, area. Like, uh, you, you don't have those kind of data. So federal has rules to prevent you to get that data. So we have to find some ways to get around that. This is the one challenge we are facing. Of course, the second is back to your, uh, in the case of uh, studies uh, issues in city of Syracuse, we actually, we plan to, con uh, to, to collaborate with the city of Syracuse. That, uh, relevant departments, uh, we talk to them, uh, we will have a meeting with them, just like uh, what we did before. Snowplow data I got act originally from their department. And then they showed me where are they available online. And but of course they have more updated data. So collaboration with local uh, authorities is the one solution I want to tell you. And then the second one, you talked about this, uh, uh, the Essentially, your question is, is about the uncertainty of the data and the validation of the data. And uh, most of them are true, but you can talk later. Okay, <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, I'm more than happy to talk to you about like, I, I try, I can understand your question and I can answer it for sure, okay. Yes, that's actually why I said uh, I'm not satisfied with the result we got because I don't think it's uh, accurate enough. Like uh, one of the factors is, uh, as you mentioned, building types, the impact, uh, the same flight would have different degree of impact for different types of buildings. That's very true. We, we didn't take that into consideration, but to, do, to take that into consideration, we, we needed to move away from the study I showed you here, which is why I said, I want to focus on local scale. Based on based on census block groups, uh, and I separated the group of buildings for each census block. Look into the more details, including urban morphology, like porosity. This could affect the evacu evacuation, like uh, willingness and the evacuation path. Just the one simple example. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, this actually very well with Blackboard Black Exactly. We would give us our opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, to come on the next. Yeah. 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 Ye
Thank you so much for Professor Jason's introduction and thank you for everyone's coming. Uh, I'm Lulu. And today, uh, the presentation topic is related to the development of a green design studio. At the beginning, I want to introduce why do we want to develop such a green design studio. So uh, normally, uh, in the United States, the buildings are responsible for about 40% of the total energy use. And if we consider the carbon emission, the buildings account for 36%. And another problem is that for the indoor environmental quality in buildings, it's very related to the human's health and the thermal comfort. But one of the problem that currently we met is that if we want to increase the occupants' health and increase their thermal comfort, the corresponding the energy consumption will increase. And how to balance indoor environmental quality as well as the energy consumption is very important. So in order to have the trade-off between the IEQ and the energy consumption, several building performance simulation tools have been proposed. And for the current building performance simulation tools, there are some limitations, such that they will only consider the indoor environmental quality, or they will only consider the energy consumption. And the cell them of them, they simultaneously consider the indoor environmental quality as well as the energy consumption. So this is the first problem. And the second problem is that most of the current tours that they propose, they only consider the single scale simulation. So what is the single scale simulation? They will only consider the room level or the building level or the community level. And how to combine the room level to the building level and then to the urban level becomes another problem. And for the third problem that they currently met is that if they consider a very large scale, such as the community scale or the urban scale, they will consume a lot of computational sources. So that means it will take a very long time to run a simulation. So this is very important problem. And another problem is that if uh, for the buildings scale or the urban scale, if they want to run something, so many complex set of parameters they need to design before the simulation. And if some users, they don't have too much knowledge about such information, they cannot easily change it. They need the expert to do that, and then they can do some analysis. So these are the whole problem of the current building performance simulation tools. 
So in order to solve these problems, we propose a framework. It is so-called the modular-based multi-scale green design studio. So what's the modular-based means? So we just set a uh, several module and it includes the from the climate mode, the, the larger scale, and then we go down to the space module, just like we consider the urban, the building, the floor, and the room. And then we have the specific settings of the space module, such as the enclosure module, we will consider the wall, the floor, the doors, and then we will also consider different types of building, different types of community. And then we will also have some uh, service module, just like uh, we have the lightning module, HVAC system, water module, and other things. And then we can do the visualization. So this is the meaning of the modular based. And the multi-scale is very uh, uh, easy to understand. We just, from the room scale, enlarge it to the zone or the flow scale, then expand it to the building scale, and then to the urban or the community scale. So this is the meaning of the multi-scale. And the foreign green design studio, it means that we can combine these things together and set several simple parameters for the users to easily change it and then to visualize it. So this is the meaning of the modular-based multi-scale green design studio that currently we propose it. So this is the whole framework of such green design studio. We just start from the modeling part. We use the Rhino software to establish the geometry of the room, the building, and the urban or the community. And then the grasshopper will be launched. Uh, the Rhino will be launched to the grasshopper to do the simulation, visualization, and design. And then for the grasshopper, there are several plugins that currently we use. We just use the Dragonfly. It's used for the urban or the community scale uh, simulation and the modeling. And then we just use the Ladybug and Honeybee to do the energy plus and the radiance analysis. And then for the Butterfly, it will be launched to the open form to show the specific airflow distribution of that. And then for the Iron Bug, it's just a plug-in to simulate the HVAC simulation. And the final part is the content. And this is used to analyze the indoor air pollution, indoor air quality distributions. And the, besides the whole framework of it, we just have a co-simulation with the fluent to do the outdoor air pollution distributions. So these are the whole framework and the whole plugins that currently we use. And the, based on this framework, we just propose a hierarchy for that framework. So we start from the site module. The meaning of the site module means that we consider the weather scale. It will include the climate. It just include the wind speed, wind direction, and air pollution of the auto. And then we also include the greening, the traffic, as well as the neighborhoods. And if we look in uh, down, we establish this space module. For the space module, it will include the room level, building level, and then to the community or the urban level. And then when we specifically look into one uh, space module, for the enclosure module, we will set the wind, the door, and the wall. And for the wall, we will also separate the roof and the ceiling. And then we also consider the occupants module. It's more related to the humans. And for this part, we will include the human activity and the human heat flux. And then we also include the surface module. It includes the HVAC system, electricity vehicle, lightning, and the water system. And the final module that we uh, design is more related to the sustainable surface module. It will include the wind energy, power grid, and the solar energy. Yeah, so this is the hierarchy of it. And for this presentation, 
I will give you four demos to show how the framework and the hierarchy works. And the first thing, the first three things that I would like to introduce is related to the building scale. The first thing I would introduce the natural ventilation. And then the, another thing is that if we add the HVAC system, what's the energy consumption will change and how the energy consumption will be. And the third thing I would like to introduce is related to the indoor air pollution distributions. And the final part, I would expand the building scale to the community and the urban scale to see what's the whole energy consumption or air pollution distribution around the whole urban or the whole, uh, whole community. So we, for the uh, building scale, I will just like use our building, the Syracuse Center of Excellence building as an example to show it. So this is our uh, building. And then based on this building, we create such a framework, just like I uh, mentioned it. We start from the site module, the large scale, the climate one, and then we go down to the space module. And for this DOE, the space module means that it's a building module. And then we look inside, we set the enclosure module, we set different types of window, doors, and walls, and then we just said, oh, what type of COE building is? Is this an office building or is this a residential building? That's the meaning of the program means. And then we set the surface module. And for this surface module, for this case, we just consider the HVAC system. And then if we set all the modules already, we just put it to the visualization part to show some results of it. So if we look into the space module, it's just like this one. This is the uh, COE building of it. It has five floors. And then for each floor, we just said it has a uh, one block of it. It has the different color. And then we also set uh, different types of window. The left side figure, these are the windows. And the right side shows the doors. And the, for the doors, we can see it includes the outer door and the inner door. These are different types of doors. And then we just uh, set the different type of modules. So this is for the enclosure module. This is just the example of the wall module. And then the things that I leave for the designers to change is the K value. And we can, at the range of the K value, it's just from maybe the zero to one, and that you can set different K values to, because the K value is more related to the uh, thermal conductivity and the people can easily change it and then they can show the results of it. And another module is related to the occupancy module. And the part that I leave for the users to change is related to this one. This is the uh, human activity. So look at this figure. This right uh, uh, y-axis represent the time from 6 a.m. to 22 p.m. And this one represents how many people will be in the office. And uh, we can easily change it. And based on this, we can see maybe start from uh, 8 a.m., some people will come to the office. And uh, start from 9 uh, to 11 a.m., most of people will in the office, they will work. And uh, for the lunchtime, some people will leave. And then after the 6 or 7 p.m., most uh, all the people will leave the office. Uh, buildings. So we can also uh, drag it and to change the percentage of that. And another module is related to the surface module. For this one, it's just uh, the HVAC system. For the HVAC system, we set different types of it. Is it a simple uh, type of uh, HVAC system or the ones to one or the others? We can easily uh, choose it. And based on that, we just give a first example of the natural ventilation of the COE building. So for the natural ventilation, it means that we just open the door and allow the outdoor airflow goes inside the building. And the, the life side figure is the hourly dry blue temperature for the whole year. 
And if we consider the natural ventilation, I just use an example from August 3rd to August 9th, because in this period, the temperature will be not too high and also will, not, will be not too low. And it's a good period to show the natural ventilation effect. And this figure shows the uh, average relative humidity. And then we can also use uh, this framework to get this result. It's the average zone air temperature. The left side figure is from the top view to see it. And the right side is from the front view to see the result of it. And also we can calculate the average outer face temperature from the outer wall compared with the average inner face of this one. And then if we use the outer face to minus interface, we can get how many uh, heat will be transferred or what's the difference from the outer part to the inner part of the walls. It's a good way to uh, do the energy consumption calculations. And another uh, example is that is the HVAC system. For the HVAC system, we just set two types of things. The first thing is related if the, uh, this area is conditioned or not. I just simplify the problem and divide the COE building into two parts. For the left part that currently we are in, which I just assume that is conditioned. And for the outer part, uh, it's not conditioned. And also it had, I said the program type and for the left, pie, left uh, part, it's the office part. And for the outer part, I just said it's empty. Yeah. And then uh, I set this set of uh, HVAC system design. And if we look at into this side, we can easily use this GDS to visualize how the HVAC system uh, is arranged. So this one, it can be divided in two parts from this line. The upper part is similar to this one. And the lower part is the demand equipment. And if we look at the upper part, we start from the fan. So this is the fan. And then we set the all door air system corresponding to this one. And then we set another fan. And then near the fan, we just set a cooling coil and a heating coil. This is a cooling coil and it's a heating coil. And if we look at the lower part, this is a demand equipment. And this block shows the number of different zones. It can be considered as the different room. And then there I have different ducts to connect to this system. And then we can get the results of that to show the cooling energy as well as the heating energy. So for the cooling energy, you can see the whole trend of that. It's more uh, focuses, it focused on from May or June to the uh, September. And for the heating energy, it's more concentrated uh, from the January to March and to the October or November to the December. And the, this one is the third case that I would like to show. This uh, video shows that we use this GDS to show the indoor PM 2.5 concentration. And uh, with the change of the time, it's the already changed the data. And uh, the indoor PM 2.5 concentration is changed. And uh, this is the COE building. And I just choose the third floor to show the whole trend of that. It looks like in this way. And then we can also use the GDS to output the specific data in different zones with the time change, with the change of the time, like this one. So these are the three cases related to the building scale. And what will happen if we enlarge the scale from the building scale to the community scale? So this is the Syracuse area uh, map, the whole map of that. And I just choose one small community to give an example of that. 
And this is the COE building that currently we are in. And I just choose about 50 buildings. And for these 50 buildings, I just simplify the area of that. The left side part, it will be considered as the office area. And for the right part, that means it will be considered as the residential area that the people will live in. And then I just set two, uh, set two different types of uh, building program. For the left part is the office building. And for the right part is the apartment building type. And also I set two different types of HVAC system. For the left part is just that uh, VAV chiller bowler. And for the right part is the PTAC bowler. And the, based on that, we can get the whole trend energy consumption throughout the whole year. It will include the pump intensity, gas intensity, cooling, heating, and electrical uh, equipment intensity. But the one point I want to mention here is that even though we choose a very uh, 50 uh, buildings and that we run the whole year of the energy consumption, but when I use my uh, computer, it will only have uh, 20 calls. And then the computational time is within five minutes. So the reason is that because when we design such a platform, we utilize the parallel computing techniques to in order to accelerate the running speed of that. So that's the reason why the computational source is very, very low. So that is one of the advantage of such GDS platform. And another thing that I would like to introduce is that we also use that GDS uh, platform to co-simulate with the fluent and to show the outdoor air pollution or the outdoor air uh, flow uh, distributions. So this is the, also the small area of the COE area. And the, this one is the highway, it's the I-81 highway. And the, we just set the inlet from the left side part and the right part is the uh, outside part. And the, for the I-81 area, we just put the PM source as a line source around across the I-81. And then we can get the PM 2.5 distributions of that. So these two figures shows about that. It shows the particulate time and it shows the particle of velocity of that. And that this direction is the inlet direction. And the, based on this figure, we can see the red part will be how much uh, higher PM 2.5 concentrations of that. So for the conclusion part, for this GDS platform, we just achieved the multi-scale simulations. It starts from a single zone, from the single room area to the floor area, and then we expand it to the building area and then enlarge it to the community or the urban area. And the, there are some advantage of such GDS platform. The first one is that it's a modular based multi-scale uh, platform. And I just leave several uh, a block for the users to easily change it. And if you, even though the people do not have too much knowledge of that, they can easily use and change it and to design something. And another advantage of that is that it's simultaneously considered the indoor and outdoor air quality or air pollution distributions as well as the energy consumption. And the third advantage is that it utilizes the parallel computing and it has a very shorter computational time to get people faster, get the result and to visualize something. So for the whole platform, we just achieved the modeling part is from the Rhino uh, combined with the Grasshopper and then use the energy plus and count time and to simulate something and then use the ladybug and the butterfly to visualize something. And then finally, we can design the building or the urban scale. So based on this framework, we just have a lab in the high bay and we will have the dinner there. It's so-called the MSVD lab, the modeling simulation visualization and the design lab. And then we can go downstairs to see this lab together. Yeah.
This is the uh, last page that I would like to introduce today. It's just more related to the future work that some of the thing that we would like to do and collaborate with all of you together. <laughs> yeah, the first thing is that because currently we just focus on a relative, maybe it's so-called a micro community skill. And when we, we would like to expand it to the whole urban area of the Syracuse area. And another thing is that it's more related to the net zero uh, energy urban design and how to consider more parameters to achieve the net zero of that. And the third thing is more related to Professor Gao's presentation and the how we can combine such GDS platform with the GIS together to analyze the social economy analysis and how to combine two things and use the advantage of two softwares together it will be another potential that we would like to do in the future. Yeah, so uh, that's the whole content that I uh, shared today. And thank you so much. Yes. Curious, uh, when you showed that data, say the PM 2.5, uh -huh. where it's going from the street and so on, how do you, is there a model you use for the transport? Are you simply using dilution or how do you do that? So uh, if you, we consider the, we just use the, uh, this GDS to combine with the Fluent software to show the PM 2.5 concentration. And that we just use the DPM model and to simulate that. And then to should see the whole distribution of that. Yeah, the model would consider both the convective transport and diffuse transport and also depressions. All these physical phenomena are considered in that model, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. So with your talk, uh, the impetus was combining models for indoor environmental quality and energy consumption in these buildings. Yep. So I'm wondering, I don't know anything about modeling. I was trying really hard to follow along. <laughs> I'll have a ton of questions later. Um, does your model that you created, this multi-scale uh, green model, allow you to come up with some kind of conclusions about design ideas that would better optimize the IEQ and the energy consumption? Uh, yeah, that's true. Oh, That's the whole advantage of this one. Consider most of the things together and combine with this and for people easily change something if they don't have too much knowledge and they can also have some good results and have some ideas about that. So were there some like practical, uh, like easily comprehensible, like examples of that? Like, I don't know, such as like lighting or heating changes or something? Yeah, something yeah. that a lay person like myself could understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can easily change, change uh, some of the parameters there, which is more related, just like the heating or, or the cooling, and that they can see how this factor affects the whole uh, energy or something else. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll just send it down. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. I, I was just curious if you have a, um, some like comparison between your model and measurement, because mm -hmm. the PM 2.5 sensors are very easily available. Like your like indoor spatial uh, modeling are really interesting. So I would think it, it would be interesting to do the comparison yeah, and see your model, model performance. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. But currently we have already uh, compared the measurement data with the GDS model. Yeah, we are currently working on that. And also we have the energy data and we would like to also compare the energy consumption of the, uh, we will use the COE as an example to compare the total energy consumption of the COE building with the GDS and to see, yeah, from the whole, whole year, <laughs> just to compare. Yeah. Another question is in terms of the indoor outdoor uh, air exchange, mm -hmm. can you output a number for like 
the transport of from outdoor to indoor and indoor to outdoor? Uh, this one can be calculated and it cannot to show it. Yeah, but we can get the data. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Great, great questions and discussions. Uh, and this is still very much in work in progress. Okay, so the model validation is one of them. We need to, we need to continue on that. So for that, actually, uh, I think previously we have the INT forum about a multi-scale test bed. So in parallel with the modeling and simulation effort, we're actually uh, instrumenting the sense the you know, this building and also different communities, so especially along the you know, two sides of the highway IAT, to look at how IAT1 and also this reconstruction project impact the environmental quality and people's exposure to various pollutants. So model validation. So any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, nothing online. So is Samira here? Um, I want to just introduce her also. So she's uh, she and many many others are working on that test bed. So you you have a chance to meet with Samira and continue with uh, uh, Lulu <laughs> and uh, uh, Ling, uh, Tong Ling, and to, you know, to ask more questions, more discussions. And, uh, so again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. This is great presentations, you know, from Professor Gao and also Dr. Um, uh, Lu <laughs> Li, Dr. Li. Uh, it's great presentation. Thank you again. Let's come, go, go to, I invite you to the high base space and to see the, the space uh, that we have down there. Enjoy the holidays. And this is a, you know, it's a new year, right? Chinese new year, lunar new year is coming. So uh, this is the pre-situation for the new year. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks.